myself at the age of 17 I blew my mind on LSD uh, prior to that I was in um, a small street gang and we did small crimes like uh, breaking in entries and hold-ups and grocery stores and with crowbars and I wasn't the tough guy in the gang I was the pusher and uh, I sold the drugs and held the door whilst they did the hold-ups and things like that and eventually, at the age of 17, I'd taken so much drugs, I blew my mind on LSD, and I developed a very serious illness, schizophrenia. I had three distinct personalities. I had my own and two others. And uh, the first personality that I had is I thought I was Jesus, and I invited all my friends over for the Last Supper. I didn't have any bread or wine, but I had some meat pie and ketchup. And I gave them a piece of meat pie each and a squirt of ketchup, and I told them to do this in memory of me. <laughs> it was a very solemn moment. And then I told them that they were all going to abandon me. This was my first prophecy that I gave them. I said, you will all abandon me. And this prophecy came true five minutes later. So I lost all my first disciples. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. And I eventually ended up in a psychiatric hospital. Maybe you can understand why now. And uh, I was given electroshock treatment and medication to take for the rest of my life. And I was told five years later that I had such a severe case of schizophrenia that I would stay probably come back into a hospital for the rest of my life roughly four years later and then five years later as I was walking down the streets thinking about all these things that had happened in my life and realizing that I had wasted my life feeling completely abandoned rejected from society I had no hope my future was a psychiatric hospital um, I had no more friends, nobody understood me, nobody could relate to me. Uh, I didn't want to live one day further. I was standing on the street corner with tears streaming down my eyes and a young lady came to share the love of Jesus with me. She w walked up to me and she told me, Bob, I remember you from high school. I remember um, how you used to have long hair and you, you know, you had girlfriends and you were cool and you were a pusher and people wanted to hang out with you. And I heard you went to a hospital and you blew your mind on LSD and you developed a really serious mental illness. And I said, yep, yeah, that's right. She said to me, listen, I've had an encounter. I've, I've had a real change in my life. Um, and I've met somebody that's, that's fulfilled me and, 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 uh, and my life has completely changed. And I said, well, who did you meet? She said, Jesus. I said, oh, great. <laughs> that was the last thing I needed. You see, in my medical report, it said that I'd had religious delirium and ideas of grandeur. In other words, I thought I was Jesus. And uh, so I couldn't see myself going to see the doctor and saying, yeah, I know I used to think I was Jesus, but now I've met him, okay? <laughs> So um, my left brain was going, no thank you, <laughs> because of the fear. And I'd categorized all Christians. They were, they were all a little delirious religiously. And I figured she was having religious delirium as she was talking to me. And uh, so as I was listening, though, my left brain was going no, and my right brain or my heart was going, maybe there's something in this. And I went home and... Uh, I got down on my knees and I said, hey, listen, um, if you're there, I really need you right now. This would be an appropriate time to come and help me. Um, I've messed up everything. I've ruined my life. I have no more friends. And I didn't expect to get healed there. I've got to tell you the truth. All I wanted was a friend. I didn't have any friends. I had nobody. I didn't have any family. 
And so all I was looking to God for was somebody who would be with me. And I said, listen, if you're there uh, and if you would come and be with me and live in my heart and, 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 and just I'll, I'll give you my life and whatever you want, I'll, I'll do it. I don't know what to do, but I mean, and I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty big mess right now. But if you would come right now and do whatever you want with what's left. And his peace and his presence came over me. Just this incredible peace and presence came over me in my bedroom. Presence that I'd never felt before. It was as if two great arms were surrounding me and hugging me. And God was in the room like he is right now. And he hugged me, and in his presence and in his love, the fear was cast out. All the trouble and all the pain left. And I remember sitting there for the next two hours in my bedroom, realizing that I knew that I'd never been Jesus. I knew that I'd never been Neil Young. <laughs> there were no Roman soldiers that were after me, no KGB. There were no cameras following me around. I wasn't in real life TV constantly. <laughs> and all of, all of a sudden, I knew everything that I believed to be true was a lie. And that the truth had come into my heart and set me free. And Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And if you know half the truth, then you're half set free. And if you know the whole truth, then you're all set free. And the Bible says that we know in part, doesn't it? And one day we will know fully as we're known of him. And one day we will see face to face, but now we see dimly as through a mirror. But one day we will see him face to face. And on that day, the Bible says in 1 John 3 verse 2, it says, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. For the moment, we don't see him clearly. But he wants to reveal himself to us. And he wants us to be free. He wants us to know freedom. And he wants to set each one of you free. And he wants you to walk in a freedom where there is no fear. Because perfect love casts out fear. He wants you to be so free that you're not intimidated by anybody. Amen. You know, there was obviously a lot of things that God still had to work out in my life. I didn't have all of a sudden pop up in a, in a, in a shirt and a tie and, you know, look smart. <laughs> it didn't just, you know, just got saved and boom, there he is. I'd been sleeping out on park benches. I was a real mess. Actually, shortly after I got saved, I, I hitchhiked across Canada. There was no church that I knew of in Quebec City. Actually, the one that I knew of, I didn't want to go there. They, I, I figured they were all delirious. <laughs> they all spoke in tongues and were hands raised. And I figured, no, that's the one place I don't want to go. <laughs> I'd received Jesus in my heart, in my bedroom. His peace and His presence that you experience in worship had come into my bedroom and heal me, but I was a little cautious of certain things, which is normal having been through what I've been through. And uh, so I hitched a hike across Canada and I came back and, um, and I'd been three months living out in parks, sleeping in park benches. And when I got back to Quebec City, I went and slept on the plains of Abraham. And uh, and after three or four days on the plains of Abraham without having a shower, and I only had a pair of overalls, no t-shirt, no underwear, no socks, I walked into the church one Sunday morning at the Café Chrétien de la Capitale where Alan Bone was the pastor at the time. I walked in and sat in one section of the church and people moved away. <laughs> See, there was a little work yet to be done. <laughs> You see, getting to know God is a process. You, you meet Him and, and, and He wants you to know Him more and more. And so, 
I was healed of schizophrenia. I've never had a relapse since. The doctors confirmed that I was healed shortly afterwards. I was permitted to stop, ta stop taking my medication before I went into that church. But when I entered that church, I had a lot of other th issues that needed to be dealt with. And so people moved away, and a lady took out a bottle of perfume and sprayed it in my direction. <laughs> well, if, you might have done the same thing if you'd smell what she'd smell. <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry there's hope for you <laughs> okay It's okay, there's hope. You're smelling pretty good this morning. <laughs> but then, you know, more changes started happening more rapidly as I was involved in the body, and I recognized that if, if I wanted people to sit next to me, you know. <laughs> a shower would help. <laughs> and so eventually I got involved in the church, and then I... And then I, I was overcome by this passion for Jesus. The problem that had happened was there was, a, there was, there was one problem that had happened as soon as I got saved was the fear had gone. Because I was so filled with his love that it, it cast out the fear. I, I had at salvation what many people are looking for all through their Christian walk was I had an encounter with the Father. I had a very, very powerful encounter with the Father and it was Father's love that cast out the fear. Um, I've always had a relationship with God the Father. Now, I've had a lot of issues that needed to be dealt with, but that wasn't one of them. The first thing I met was Father. The Holy Spirit bore witness with my spirit that I was His child, and the Holy Spirit presented me to the Father. And I fell in love with Him. And His love cast out the fear. And, you know, because I wasn't totally healed up and I had a lot of other issues to deal with, this was a problem for Pastor Bowen because, uh, you see, I had no fear, none. So I got myself into all kinds of situations. <laughs> I would go out and preach on the streets. I, I just, can I just talk about, you know, so you know about me and my wife and, you know, what's the point of this old big hairy message when you don't even know who I am, right? So just hold your horses, we'll get there. <laughs> and for those of you that just, I'll give you a bit of word. If you absolutely need some scripture, I'll give it to you. Don't worry, you'll get it, okay? <laughs> breathe in, breathe out, we'll get there. <laughs> if you're sitting on your chair and you're going, where is the scripture? Relax. <laughs> anyway, I, saw, I started preaching, you know, uh, in street corners. That's where I learned to preach. If you're wondering what kind of a preacher we got, that's not, you know, it's because I learned on street corners. I didn't learn in a church. I don't do it the proper way. I don't have a three-point introduction, conclusion. Okay? I began, I began preaching to anything that moved. <laughs> I, I, I would get up on the street corners in Quebec and I would start preaching, going to cafeterias and preach. I would preach in buses. Buses are a great place. You have a captive audience. And you know, the Holy Spirit would come. Believe it or not, He would come. The Holy Spirit would come. I would start sharing. And because you see, because there was no fear, the Holy Spirit would come. There was a lot of other things that needed to be dealt with, but I want to tell you one thing. The Holy Spirit would come, and whole crowds in buses, on street corners, crowds of between 50 and 300 people were coming to Jesus at a time like that. And sometimes the glory of God would come down over whole crowds. And so, now I'm going to tell you a bit about my wife. Can I tell you a bit about my wife? Because I haven't told you about her yet. 
So, so it's, it's time now. <laughs> so, <laughs> I will get through this, don't worry. You're going to have a very funny video. You know, this guy has been walking back and forth. And he, anyway, he's talking to himself. So my wife came to the Lord, and when she came to Jesus, she came up, to, she came to the Lord right, way up in Setsil, Seven Islands, right up the north coast. And uh, it's really cold up there. And they have bears in the woods, you know, and moose and deer, and they have whales on, you know, in, in the St. Lawrence River up there. And uh, she would go hunting with her father. She didn't like hunting, so she would scare the animals away before her father could shoot them. <laughs> And, uh, but she was also a ballerina. That's not an odd combination, you know, a hunter and a ballerina. Anyway, and she loved going into the woods, and she's been in the woods and met bears, you know, face to face. The kind of woman you don't want to mess with. And, uh, and she, she came to the Lord during these, this, this revival that was happening at that time throughout the east of the province of Quebec. Pastor Bowen came into Quebec City, and he started ministering, uh, you know, through, through different towns, and, and, uh, and was sent, he was sending teams out, and there was a team that was sent out to Setzil, and, and then there was a church that was born there, my wife walked into this church, and she got saved, and she rode home on her bicycle that evening, and as she was ride, riding home on her bicycle, she, um, she started singing in tongues, the Holy Spirit came over her, she never knew what, was, what hit her, but she woke up the next morning, the Lord said to her, I've got a gift for you. Now, all her life, what she wanted to do was, her dream was to, now, her dream was to meet a whale and, and play with a whale and dance with a whale, okay? This was what she'd always wanted all her life. It was this ballerina-hunter combination that was going on. <laughs> and, um, and so... <laughs> Are you okay, dear? You gotta <laughs> breathe. Breathe. <laughs> it's always important to breathe when, when you're laughing. You sometimes forget, you go, <gasps> <laughs> So, <laughs> So, where were we? Oh, yes. And so the Lord wakes her up the next morning and says, Come, 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 come down to the beach. I, I, I have a gift for you. And so she comes down to the, to the beach. She'd never heard the voice of the Lord, you know. And this was the next morning. She goes down to the beach, and she sits on the beach. And the beach goes down like 20 or 30 feet, like in certain places in Seven Islands. goes down really, really quickly. You've got to know how to swim if you want to go to the beach. And so, and so as she's sitting there, within about 10, 15 seconds, this big blue whale pops his head out, nods his head like this, as if to say, come on. And so they run down the beach and, and, and play together for the next 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And that was, that was her gift when she came to the Lord. <laughs> and so every day she would go and pray at the beach there. You know, that became a favorite spot from that point on. And she would go and pray there every morning and she would say, you know, praise God and and in the next few weeks, the Lord started speaking to her and saying, Listen, I'm going to take you away from this place that you love. And I'm going to bring you to Quebec City at one point. And you're going to go and you're going to meet an evangelist. He's bilingual. Il est bilingue. That's me. <laughs> you're going to meet an evangelist. He, he's bilingual. And... and uh, and he doesn't know it yet, but he's going to be an international evangelist. He's going to travel around the world, and you're going to be his wife. So she knew all this before I did. I, I was just a street preacher. I had no clue what I was going to do. And so she eventually moved to Quebec City, and she went to college, Cégep, in Quebec City. And, um, and I was one day preaching in the cafeteria in that Cégep on the table, and <laughs> preaching to everything that could move. <laughs> and she was sitting at one of those tables and going, thank you, God, it's not him. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so, so and, and, and our church was really growing, and, and we were planting other churches, and this church that I joined now was about a thou, roughly a thousand members, and so she was going to the same church, and we hadn't met yet, so she came, she went to church that Sunday morning, and she saw me. So she went to see Pastor Bourne. She said, hey, listen, Pastor Bourne, there's a crazy man that comes to our school and gets up on cafeteria tables and preaches. He says, who is he? And she says, it's him. He says, yeah, I know him. I sent him. <laughs> and so the next... So he brings us together and he takes our hands and he prays and he, he's really prophetic, you know, if you've ever, ever met him or know him, he's really a prophetic kind of guy. And uh, I don't even know if he knew what he was praying, but he said, oh Lord, I pray that you bring these two together and you teach them how to work together from this point on. And so my wife, being a very, very simple follower of Jesus, just came along with us from that point on. And she, but she wasn't in love. There was no way. <laughs> but the next week it went better. You know, she hadn't seen me when the glory had come down. She just saw me when it wasn't working well in the cafeteria and I was looking like a fool. You see, there were good days and there were bad days, you know. See, there was a lot of work that needed to be done in this vessel. And so the next week I went back to the same college and I went into the student lounge and it was one of the good days, you know. And I started speaking to about 100, 150 students in the student lounge. And it was about as big or maybe just a little bigger than this room here. And uh, there's about 100 students, right? right and they were jam-packed right in and all around. And there was two arch, arch entrances to go into the student lounge, if you, if you know Cégep Saint-Foy. And, and I was standing there speaking to them and, um, and sharing with them. And the Holy Spirit's presence was coming. And somebody in the, in the, in the sound room decided we better turn up the, the, the music. So, so they turned up the rock music and there were two big sound speakers at the back. And I was, I was preaching with a friend of mine. We were doing tag preaching at this point. Um, and, and nobody taught us how to do this, but we were, I would preach 20 seconds, he would preach 20 seconds, and you know, when I, when I would preach, I would think, boy, am I getting intelligent. Has that ever happened to you? you, you the Holy Spirit, <laughs> and then he would preach, and I'd go, he's getting intelligent too. And so there we were preaching, you know, trying to, trying to develop our intelligence, and, and as we were preaching, they put up the sound in the back of the room, uh, and the two speakers were blaring out rock music and nobody could hear us anymore. And so I figured, now what do we do? And so I was scratching my head thinking to myself, now what do we do? And I looked at him and said, what, what do we do now? But he always knew what to do in these situations. He looked at that sound speaker and he went, in the name of Jesus, shut up. <laughs> and the thing blew up. The sound speaker just went, push. I'm thinking to myself, not only is this guy getting intelligent, he's getting a little dangerous. <laughs> that, was, that was a good day. That was a really good day. And then the next thing that happened was, was even worse. There was this guy who looked pretty well, you know, normal during the rest of the time we'd ever seen him at that school. But all of a sudden... Something took a hold of him, and he started running in front of us, waving his arms, going, These are the sons of God! Listen to them! <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, I read something like that somewhere. <laughs> and I remembered, yeah, that happened to the apostles. And I always wondered why they had shut him up, because I figured, what better publicity can you get than that, you know? But you know what? It ended out that he was making more noise than the sound speakers. And nobody was listening to us. He became a distraction. So there again I started thinking, what do we do now? I went back to my friend and I said, so what do we do? 
But my, the problem with my friend is he only had one thing to do. He always did the same thing. He looked at the guy and he went, In the name of Jesus, shut up! And I thought, No, don't do this. He's going to blow up. <laughs> you get sued for blowing people up. Okay? If you're taking notes. <laughs> but he didn't blow up. He just... But he went and sat down, and, and then the presence of God came through that place. And, and students had been packing in. They, now the place was packed. People were sitting around my feet. They were upright against the wall, and, and the art, archways were filled with people right into the hallway. And the glory of God just came down over that place. I don't know how many students were there. And my wife was there too. And she said, hmm, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> we make some progress. <laughs> So at this point, when the presence of God was there, I knew what to do. And I said, how many of you here right now do you want to know Jesus? And every hand in that place went up just like that. There was not one, I don't think there was one hand that stayed down. And we led them all into the sinner's prayer, every one of them. And there was weeping, and there, many of them were crying, and... And those that were really serious for Jesus, we would take them out of the group. You know, we'd take them aside and we formed a cell group. And we went around the colleges like this and shared the gospel. And this is how I came to the Lord. And, and you know, that's the, that was a good story. But because of this no fear thing, you see, I would get myself in all kinds of situations. There was my brother-in-law who was the president of the motorcycle gang before he became my brother-in-law. And one, maybe I'll tell you about his story. And there was whole, a whole motorcycle gang that gave their lives to Jesus. And, and then there was the occasion that I was attacked by a full crowd of 300 people and a satanic group. <laughs> and the police had to come and get me out of there because the crowd had surrounded me. And I was standing in the middle of St. John Street. And a crowd of 300 on St. John Street means that the cars don't move anymore. And so... Because St. John Street is the main street into the walls of the city, that means that the whole city is stopped. <laughs> and this, say, <laughs> anyway, so you can see the, pot, the, pro, the, the, the problems the pastor had, you see. He would get calls from the police. Does, is this a member of your church? <laughs> yes. <laughs> We know that there's a little work yet to be done in him, but he really has a good heart. <laughs> On that occasion, it was a very, very powerful moment. My wife was there, and there was about 20 members of the church there. And the satanic group had been meaning to kill me because we were doing too much speaking in the streets, and too many people were getting touched, and prostitutes, and motorcycle gang members, and... and and, you know, you're disrupting the whole economy of the city, I think, eventually. And, uh, and uh, well, certain parts of the economy. And, uh, and so then a sa sa satanic group started putting death threats on, on, on our lives, and on my life especially. And so it, it, was ha it, it happened that I was sharing with about 40 or 50 people on St. John Street, and then this... This crowd that had been doing a man, you know, that had been picketing on Parliament Hill, they came down St. John Street and they joined the first crowd, and that's how it became a crowd of 300. And because they were so big, I ended up in the middle of the street, and all the cars couldn't move, and everything got jammed up. And then this satanic group that were doing a seance or a session on the second floor poked their heads out of the window according to the group, because I didn't see this. And they said, there he is, we've got him now. And they came down with baseball bats. There was about 14, 15, or 20 of them, or whatever. And they surrounded the crowd. I didn't see this. I didn't see any of this. My wife and everybody else saw this, but I didn't see this part. Because the crowd was so big at this point. And they surrounded the crowd with the baseball bats, and they started going, glory to Satan, kill him! And the crowd was already worked up against government, and so I was, you know, I was trying to talk to them about God, which is ultimate government, and 
And that just wasn't working for some odd reason. I didn't know why they were getting so upset. And the satanic group jumped on the occasion and they pushed the crowd in going, glory to Satan, kill him. And the crowd just went crazy. And then they rushed at me. And I didn't really understand. I, I wasn't sure if they'd really understood what I was preaching about. So I figured if I'm going to die, I better at least let them know why I'm dying. And why they killed me. So I figured I was going to mention the name of Jesus as they were rushing on me a few times just to know why they killed me, right? And, uh, and so they rushed at me and, then I, I, and I said, Jesus. And as I said, Jesus, the most amazing thing happened. They all flew back 15 feet. Every, this all flew back right around me. I forget, I, I thought to myself, forget the sermon, let's stick with Jesus. <laughs> and so they rushed at me again. And I figured, wow, let's try it again. I went, Jesus, and they all flew back. I thought, wow, this is fun. <laughs> and I was starting to enjoy this. It was like, I would tell you, I was like a dream. It was like, honestly, it was just like being in a dream. And, 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 and it was like surreal. And here they are, they're running at you. And I figured, and I was doing this for I don't know how long. It might have been five minutes. It could have been 20 minutes. I haven't got a clue how long. I just lost all sense of time. It might have been 10 seconds. But they rushed at me. Several times, maybe three, five, ten, I haven't got a clue. But I was just standing there going, Jesus, and they'd fly back, and then they'd gather themselves, and they'd get all worked up again, and they'd rush at me, and their eyes would beat red, and there were, the veins were popping out of their throat, and I knew if they got a hold of me, it was over. So I figured I better stick with Jesus as long as I could. <laughs> and so then somebody was really intelligent on the sidewalk and he called the police and said there's a fellow that's going to die very shortly if you don't get here <laughs> and my, by, by this time my wife had fallen in love with me okay <laughs> so, so uh, well she, you know she wasn't my wife obviously at that time but I mean she was you know she was starting to think about it and and she was going my future husband is he still there? <laughs> it was quite a decision she had to make when she decided to marry me. I'm telling you. <laughs> and so the police came and they, they had to push out the crowd. You know they had to take out their guns to get the crowd back and threaten them because they were so angry. And then they put... I, me in, in between, one was in front of me, one was behind me, and they walked me out of that crowd, and they sat me down in the car, and the crowd shook the car, and, 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 and they said, what did you do to them? <laughs> what, what, what did you say to them? They said, we've never seen a crowd like that. I mean, and, and, and he went on to say, listen, I have worked at La Fête Saint Jean Baptiste, okay, in Quebec City, and I've never seen anything like this. What did you do to them? I said, do you really want to know? <laughs> they said, yes. So I said, well, do you have a few minutes? <laughs> <laughs> and so I told them about how I came to Jesus, and I told them that that's what I was sharing with them, and the Holy Spirit came over the two policemen, and they said, well, you know what? We're impressed. You know, and we would like to know Jesus. So I prayed with them so that they received Jesus. <laughs> Whilst the crowd was there shaking the car. <laughs> forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. <laughs> but then they had a dilemma. Because they didn't want to bring me to the police station. Because you know what? I had caused a riot in, in all, I mean, the whole of the center of town was just jammed up and there was a riot going on. And normally you have to bring people in like that. And they called up the police station and they said, well, listen, I said, um, we've got him. <laughs> oh, and on the other end, you know, they, I suppose they said, well, what's he like? And they said, no, no, he's fine. He's fine. It's, it's okay. Um, we, we just called the pastor of his church. 
And, and uh, he, he, he was just sharing a little bit. Of, anyway, finally, they managed to get me out of going to jail. And they brought me. So when my wife had to make the decision, <laughs> she, she broke up with me for three months, and she took three months of fasting and praying. <laughs> And one day the Lord came to her and said, do you love him? And she said, yes, I do. And he says, you know his ministry? She says, yes, I do. He says, you don't have to marry him if you don't want to. <laughs> she says, oh, thank you. <laughs> but if you do marry him, you're going to have to, you know, let him do what I've called him to do. But I give you the choice. If you want to marry him, you can. If you don't, you don't have to. And so she cried that whole afternoon. <laughs> but she was in love. And she wanted to do God's will. And so, and she's been the perfect lady for me. She knows that I, maybe I'll never come back. She knows I got this problem of no fear. <laughs> I mean, there, I do fear some things like little dogs. I mean, God's still working on me, okay? <laughs> but I've been picked up by a 450-pound hell's angel who said, I want to kill you. I said, can you do it quickly? <laughs> oh, I've been on too long. Forgive me. Are you Okay. Well, you know, we, we, I should tell you that those were, were good years, and then eventually, you know, my wife and I founded a teen challenge center. I became an administrator, and I lost that first love relationship that I'd had in the first two or three years of my walk with Jesus. And uh, for the next seven or eight years, I started studying in Scripture where about the glory and about how his presence and about first love relationship and I wanted it back. And this is what we're going to be sharing with you in the next few days. How I found it back and how I've got more now. Now when the glory comes on the streets, people go out. <laughs> Yesterday I was in the park in St. Jerome. <laughs> And we brought two people to the Lord on the park, and they, and, they, and they were drunk in the Holy Spirit. And I prayed with this lady who, and she went out. And we tried to carry her to the bench, but she couldn't sit on the bench because the glory was too strong on her. There are times when I've seen the glory of God come down on whole crowds. In Leicester Square last year, I was preaching out on a street corner, and the, and the glory of God came down over 150 people. They all got stuck. They couldn't move. They, I mean, they were literally stuck. I'd been speaking to them for 15 minutes, and I thought to myself, they're not moving. I better let them go. I said, thank you for listening to me. God bless you. Have a good day. I went and sat down, and they wouldn't move. <laughs> I thought, if they're not going, I'm going to come and give them another 15 minutes. So I'm, so I, I came up to them. I said, if you're not leaving, I'm going to speak to you for another 15 minutes. They still wouldn't leave. So I spoke to them some more, and I... And then at the end, I said, thank you very much. Have a good day. I went and sat down, and they still wouldn't leave. I thought to myself, what's the matter with this crowd? <laughs> so I got back up and said, if you're not leaving, I'm going to lead you into the sinner's prayer. I figured with a threat like that, they'd all go, but they didn't. They just didn't move. They couldn't move. They were all stuck. So I said, bow your heads, and they all bowed their heads, and I led them into the sinner's prayer. And I said, thank you very much for listening. Have a good day. I went and sat down, and they stood and wouldn't move. And then the whole crowd, 150 of them, started applauding. A real loud applause. I thought to myself, I think God is doing something here. <laughs> you know, there are days when I'm slow. Do you have slow days? <laughs> you know, God has been doing something for 35 minutes, and you haven't picked it up. <laughs> They, they, you know, tell us what to do. We're ready. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, 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 I'd been training evangelists from all around England in the area of, you know, 
power evangelism. And, and so I said to the team that was with me, I said, go out and ask them if they feel God's presence. I mean, what an understatement. And so they went, they went out and started asking people. And, and the leader of the event went out and asked these two men, said, do you feel, do you feel God's presence? And they said, well, we, we, we feel something. The problem is we can't move. We're stuck. <laughs> two men in their 40s that were stuck there, and one man was shaking like this. And he, not only can I, can I move, but I'm, I'm scared. And, and, and what's going on? And so she called me over and said, come and explain to them what's going on. Yes, this is if I knew. So, <laughs> you know, so, so I'm coming over to trying to explain, and I was making something up in my head, you know, something, you know, really spiritual or that sounded good. And, I, and as I came to say this to him, the Holy Spirit came over him, and he went out. And somebody caught him before he landed on the ground, picked him up, and he took off. He said, I'm out of here. I looked to the other one. I said, do you want to go too? He said, yes, but I can't go. I'm stuck. <laughs> I said, do you want to receive Jesus? He said, yes, I do. Now, this is a new form of evangelism. You get them stuck, and until they accept Jesus, they can't go. <laughs> so he received Jesus in his heart. And all through the place, there were things like that happening. One of the most beautiful situations was, was one of the team members. Her name was Angie. She was talking to this, to this Englishman. You know, we're in England, right? And so... And so he's a typical Englishman. He's, 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 he's propped up on this lamppost because the glory of God is on him. And as she's speaking to him, the, you know, the glory is coming over him and, he, and he's losing it. And he, and he wants to hear the message, but he can't get it because he's going out. <laughs> and so, so, so what, what, just before he hit the ground, he'd go, could you stop so that I could gather myself? <laughs> And then, he <laughs> and then he would gather himself, prop himself up, you know, and we, we had finished praying with everybody, and we were waiting for Angie. Where's Angie? And she comes back 45 minutes later. She says, I've been talking to this guy, and she explained what was happening. It took 45 minutes to lead him to the Lord, because every time she spoke, he'd go out. So eventually he came to Jesus. But all through that place, beautiful things were happening. Young people were, were laughing and getting filled with the Holy Spirit. And I, and I, was, I preached seven sermons out on, on Leicester Square in those, in those two afternoons. And eventually, I, you know, and when you're preaching without a microphone and, 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 and there are loud speakers on one side because there are musicians that have got amplifiers on both sides of you and... and, and and on one occasion, I remember speaking. I don't really have a loud voice. I remember speaking, and there's tens of thousands of people in that square all around, you know, all through there. And I remember speaking, and the Lord took my voice, and it went over the amplification system, over everything. And it was resounding throughout the whole place. I was listening to my voice resounding right off the walls, over the sound speaker. And everything stopped all throughout the square and all around the Leicester Square area. And I didn't know... That, uh, you know, I didn't know how far it was going, and there was this couple who were walking two blocks away, you know, and this is a city center of London with cars and trucks and people, and they were walking two blocks away, and they came into Leicester Square, and they said, where is this man that was speaking? We could hear him speak as if he was speaking in our ears, and he, they came over to, then they found me, and they said, we heard you two blocks away, and we heard the word that you were speaking in our ears, and we've come because there's this peace in our heart that's drawn us right here. What do we have to do? And so they gave their lives to Jesus. There were beautiful things like that. At one point, I just got so tired of preaching. I lost my voice, by the way. And so I said, forget preaching. You know, we're just going to get around in a circle and pray. And so we got around in a circle with the Christians and prayed. And all we were doing was praying together. And the glory of God would come down in the little circle. And the crowd would still gather. We didn't want the crowd no more. We got tired of crowds. Uh, but they were still gathering. We wanted to stop and go home, you know. But then they were still gathering. They were wanting to know what was going on. What are you doing? What, what, what? And, and, and this crowd of 50, 75, 100, 150 people started gathering to see what was going on whilst we were praying. And then one of the team members 
lost it. The Holy Spirit came on her. She was trying to hold up. She'd been fighting for about 15 minutes, and then all of a sudden, bonk, she goes out. And two young ladies say to, say to us, can we replace her? <laughs> yeah, sure. They came into the circle. The Holy Spirit came on them. Boom, they go out. And then this Muslim comes along and says, can we replace them? And so, <laughs> no matter what we did, <laughs> <laughs> and all these people came to know Jesus. We led the Jamaican musicians on one side to the Lord. We led this mind to the Lord. There was this mind dressed in silver, you know, painted in silver. He gets stuck naturally. And he... <laughs> but his crowd moved over to listen to what we were saying. And he lost his crowd. So he came over to see what was going on. There's some people out on the floor and he wanted to know what's what, on the ground. What, what's going on with them? So he looked at them and then he got really stuck. He got stuck like this. And so we had to go and speak to him. And he, he received Jesus to get set free. <laughs> and that's what Jesus does. He sets you free. I'm going to lead, lead you. I'm going to read you a verse now, okay? For all those of you that need the verse, here it comes. <laughs> you wanted a verse, you're going to get it. Romans 8. You got a Bible? I don't see anybody turning. Romans 8. This week, there's going to be fun. It's going to be fun, but it's also going to be beautiful and rich. You're going to meet the presence and the glory of God this week. You will. Why do I have that assurance? I've been doing this for years and years and years and years. His presence always comes. I don't know. I mean, I, I try to speak so that he wouldn't come. He'd still come. <laughs> I used to have off days, now I don't, and I've tried to get them off, but they won't go off anymore. So don't. <laughs> Holy Spirit has showed up on every meeting for the last seven or eight years. I can't remember the last time he wasn't there. So, but I'd gotten dry. I've become an administrator, and I searched for eight years, and this is what I'm going to be sharing on, my findings. <laughs> and how I rediscovered the glory and the presence of God, and how I found His presence again. <laughs> Boy, I've got the French Bible here. Hold on. Let me just switch. Okay, we're now in the New King James Version. <laughs> For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are His children. And this is going to be happening. It's going to be taking place. The Holy Spirit's presence is going to be coming. And as we go along in each meeting, it's going to get stronger and stronger. And some days the glory is going to come in here and some of you are going to get stuck, won't be able to move. And some of you will weigh up to a thousand pounds. And that's not an insult. No, we will not be feeding you. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit's presence is going to get very, 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 very thick. And His glory is going to come in and you're going to have an encounter with Him. And it's going to change you. I'm not saying that you're, you're, you're going to be completely free. Because that's a process that happens till the day we meet Him. But I'm going to, I know this week that there will be some powerful changes in your lives. Amen. Everywhere I go, this is what we see. Verse 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 
God wants you to encounter him so that you can reveal his glory to a dying world. Not that you do it in your strength. Not that you change or you're going to become street preachers like me or, or, or anything like that. But that when you walk in to a place, God's glory is going to be with you. You know, there's periods of time since the Holy Spirit's presence has come back where I walk into restaurants and I try to order. I've, I, this happened on several times at uh, McDonald's or Wendy's. I've just tried to order my hamburger just like a normal individual. And as I'm ordering my hamburger, I... <laughs> <laughs> I was in Moncton, <laughs> and we'd come out of the church service with a pastor, and he says, we're going to bring you to Wendy's. I said, oh, great, I'm hungry. You know, I just want, I, I was tired of ministry. I just wanted to go and eat a hamburger. Does ever, you ever get a hamburger attacks? Good, okay, good. You're normal like me. I, and so I, I, I walked into Wendy's with them, and I just... I, and they were standing with me, and I, and I just wanted to order my hamburger. And as I ordered the hamburger, the, the young lady behind the counter goes out. Boom. <laughs> so they figure she'd fainted, right? And I knew what was going on. I'm going, here we go again. <laughs> There's no break, you know. <laughs> and so the, this other young lady comes to replace her. And so the other young lady comes to replace her, and then she gets all heavy, and she's, she goes out behind the counter, and she's hanging on to the cash register. So the manager comes along and says, well, what's going on here? And I'm trying to explain. As I'm trying to explain, he starts going out. And so, you know, have you ever heard of evangelism explosion? This is evangelism explanation. Yeah. Before you know it, you have to start. No, no, listen, don't worry. This is all very normal. This is, the, this is Jesus, this is the Holy Spirit. We just came out of church, and, and I know what you're experiencing is very different. One day I was, I was driving, we were going through the drive through at McDonald's, minding our own business, just wanting to order a hamburger through the intercom system. And I was with an elder from the church in Stratford, and, and we were ordering our hamburger, and the Holy Spirit goes through the intercom system, lands the guy at the other end, and he, he got stuck with his finger, you know, on the, on, the, on the button, and you could hear him laughing. <laughs> and he wouldn't stop laughing. And so somebody comes, you hear this, because he's still got his finger on the thing, you know. And, and somebody comes along and says, okay, it's okay now. Move aside, we'll take the order if you can't do it. And so then, then the button turns off, and then he, then he comes back on, and somebody else is on the, you know, on the line. And they're saying, okay, we will take your order now. And in the background, we're hearing, ah! This too will pass, right? <laughs> oh dear. Where were we? Intercom, yes. We, 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 we go and park. <laughs> Eat our... decides to go in and find out what's happening to this guy. Well, he's still propped up against one of the, one of the pillars in the place, and he's still laughing. He's laughing his head off. And so he, has to, he goes up to him and he says, what, what, what happened? 
He said, well, somebody took an order. And when they took the order, I became drunk. <laughs> it's as if I've smoked a joint. He says, but it's better. <laughs> he says, I can't stop laughing. He says, I can't function anymore. They've replaced me. He said, what was that about? And so the elders started to have explaining what happened. You see, this is what God wants to, you know that He's not just doing this for the fun of it. He wants us to be carriers of His glory and His presence wherever we go. Sometimes it's going to be funny. Sometimes people will get stuck. We haven't got a clue how it's going to happen. Because he goes, let's read that again. Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time. You feel your suffering? We all go through sufferings and deserts. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us for the earnest expectation of creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. They're waiting for sons that know that they have fathers. They're waiting for sons that are fearless because of the assurance they have with their father. They're waiting for people that are in first love relationship with their father. It's, you can't do it by yourselves. You've been trying really hard. Don't worry, this is not about, we're not going to get you on some exercise program either. <laughs> You've been like Peter. You try to go to the cross and die for Jesus. And the devil has wanted to sift you as wheat when you failed. This is not about doing it in your own strength. This is about, this is going to be about meeting him, having an encounter with him. And it's nothing that you will do. It's nothing that you will have done. It'll be something that He will do in your heart and you will fall in love with Him and then you will become a carrier of His presence and His glory wherever you go. You will be a carrier. I've been to places where people have become carriers. We were in California and this young man went through a series of meetings in the presence of God and he went back to school and, and, and there were school bullies that would bully him. And uh, the, the school bullies came up to him and pushed him around and he turned around and he said, what if you could feel God's presence? Would you laugh at my Christianity then? And they said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, if I pray for you and God's presence comes on you, will you believe me then or leave me alone? They said, yes, sure. And <laughs> they didn't know what they were getting into. <laughs> He laid hands on them and they went both out. One of them the whole afternoon had to be carried from classroom to classroom. When it was time for gymnasium, you know, they had to go to the gymnasium. They laid him on the floor and he laughed and rolled around all afternoon. They had to carry him home. Nothing worked, nothing functions. The legs, the head, the shoulder. He was under the glory, out for the count. Don't worry, they never bothered him again. <laughs> he would walk down the hallway and they'd, go, they'd walk aside. You're having problems with bullies? I can guarantee you one thing. The Holy Spirit is the answer. I used to be bullied when I was at school. Get a good dose this week. Oh, it's worth it. It's worth it for whatever you do. I'm not saying you're going to be like me. That's not the point. That's not the goal. I don't want to produce little bobs. <laughs> be thankful. <laughs> we want you to be you the way you are, the way you're called. If, if you have difficulty going into your work and speaking about Him, don't worry. Relax. Breathe in, breathe out. Just come and get the glory. You go in, people will get attracted to you. What, what is this on you? What, what, you? There's so much peace around you. Can you pray for me? And when you pray for them, 
bonk. It's going to happen. The creation is eagerly awaiting the revelations of the sons of God. They're waiting for you. They're waiting for you. They're waiting that you have your inheritance because it says when you're a son of God, you have an inheritance. You're a co-inheritor. I mean, of everything that Jesus has, anointing, blessing, assurance, freedom. You see, the word salvation in the Greek soteria it means safety, salvation, healing, prosperity, wholeness, nothing missing, nothing lacking. This is what Jesus came to do. Give us fullness and wholeness. And I know that the fullness of that is coming when He's coming back. But until then, we can at least have what He had on earth before He had His glorified body. Amen. There's so much more, children. And not to put you under a burden. This is no burden I have. I'm telling you, it is fun from morning till night. Sometimes I laugh in my sleep. Are we also going to be teaching you how to get out of the desert quickly? There's the shortcut and there's the 40-year route. I teach you how to get blessed in the desert. How to have glory in your sufferings. And how to see the victory in your lives. How to, how to really see it. This is not no fake program. I guarantee you, you will see change. You will. It works. Father, we love you. We bless you. No, don't get all spiritual on me right now. Holy Spirit, flow. Right through. Flow. Flow. Okay, there's a gentle wind coming through right now. Flow. Flow. For some, and, and each time I do this is because I'm very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I flow with Him. When I, I'll do it when I... Yeah. Now, flow. There again. Flow. Who's been getting those winds? Just raise your hand. You've been feeling the wind. <laughs> flow. If the wind has been coming over you right now, hey, I, I need five... Five, at least five catchers. And this is just a test run because it gets stronger every day. <laughs>